This episode is sponsored by Audible. 2022 is all about celebrating our newfound self-awareness and making positive change. Audible helps make space for what matters to you. It's a destination for your wellness, whether you're looking to soul search, be inspired, work towards new goals, unwind, or simply be entertained. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. You'll discover exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. Audible also includes thousands of podcasts, from popular favorites to exclusive new series. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. We've had time to figure out what truly makes us happy. And with Audible, we can have more of it. Visit audible.com slash listening or text listening to 500-500. That's audible.com slash listening or text listening to 500-500. That's 500-500. Welcome to the FUMS Now podcast show, where you'll gain information, inspiration, and motivation for living your best life with multiple sclerosis. Find us online at FUMSnow.com. I'm your host, Kathy Reagan Young. Hey there. I wanted to share another fantastic podcast in the Offscript Health Network's family of pods. It's called The Cycle, and it's endometriosis stories from patients, as well as helpful information about the disease and ways to cope with it. Their goal is to share endo stories from people all over the world to empower people everywhere. It's beyond awareness. It's about tools to live your life better while dealing with endometriosis. And it provides a community of people who understand what it means to live with this debilitating condition. Look for this cycle wherever you get your podcasts, and I'll put a link in today's show notes. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the FUMS podcast. I really appreciate you being here with me today. Today, I'm speaking with the co-founder of the Neuro Studio, a Pilates studio focusing on people with neurological conditions. But before I introduce you to her, I want to share a resource with you. It's the Patients Getting Paid podcast and membership community. This is where people with chronic illness learn to find and create flexible remote work situations that both accommodate their health challenges and generate an income. There are condition-specific gigs updated weekly twice monthly members only coaching calls and co-workings trainings and workshops and the most amazingly supportive and loving community on the planet guaranteed interested learn more at patientsgettingpaid.com okay let's get to our guest mariska brelin has been living with ms for more than 20 years and since 2013 she's taught more than 1,400 movement professionals and physical therapists across the globe how to work with those with MS to help minimize disability and recover function. Her work has been recognized by the National MS Society as well as the United Kingdom's MS Society. I found her through my own PT who's training me on Pilates right now. We'll talk about that too. I'm thrilled to welcome her to the pod. Welcome, Mariska. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here. All right. So let's start right at the beginning. Can you please tell us about your life before MS, like right up to the time of diagnosis? Well, if we start at the very beginning, I am a dual citizen. So I'm a Dutch citizen and an American citizen, which was made for an interesting upbringing. So not only am I half Dutch, half American, I'm Dutch city. And then my dad is from Mississippi. So we're like, you know, could not have more opposite (laughs) parents. Um, I grew up in Chesapeake, Virginia, which is Yay. where you live. That's where um, I live. <laughs> which I just always tell everyone is like Virginia Beach because it's next door. But since nobody knows where Chesapeake is, right. you know, that's usually how I answer it. <laughs> um, I worked in television and video production for a very long time. So I started working for the CBS affiliate right out of college, but I had already been working in like public relations and media in college. I was one of those people who was, you know, I just got working full-time when I was 19. Mm -hmm. And then I also worked in um, big event production. I did some of the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, I worked for Samsung and ExxonMobil and Walmart on like really big events and projects. I worked on the Vancouver Olympics So I was always doing, um, you know, kind of big things with like celebrities and traveling all over the place. And I had a very exciting life, I think. Um, Yeah, sounds like it. I had kind of the job that 
all sorts of people wanted and would have killed for. And I just sort of, you know, fell into it and was lucky enough to have it. Mm. But it was a, st- a very stressful job. Yeah, you know, I it was bet. the handling I bet. Mm-hmm. big things for, with a lot of money involved that, you know, if anything went wrong, it would be, you know, it's not like getting MS. It's not like going wrong, like on that level, but it was like <laughs> to them, like it was like a huge, big deal. Yeah. Right. Okay. So how did this diagnosis happen? What kind of, when did you start having symptoms? What were they and how did you get diagnosed? So I, I can look back into my early twenties and see symptoms that I had. Like I used to have just the most horrible migraines, especially if I got really hot Mm -hmm. and, you know, grew up in a beach town. So it got really hot (laughs) quite regularly. Often, Mm -hmm. And then I would have things like all of my fingertips would go numb or, you know, my, would be, be slurring my speech kind of randomly, but you know, I wasn't drunk or anything. And I was like, it's really weird. And I couldn't, you know, you just kind of get weird buzzing sensations and different things. And I went to a doctor at one point, cause I had like that, my outer left thigh just felt numb and weird, weird. Yeah. And <laughs> The, you know, the doctor couldn't figure out anything. She was like, well, the way you're describing it, it sounds like shingles, but you don't have any blisters or any symptoms that she's mm. like, you know, maybe it's a pinch nerve, you know, and, and everything was a pinch yeah. nerve in my yeah. opinion. Yep. It's a pinch nerve. It went away. It was, you know, it lasted like six weeks or something. And then it went away. And then I didn't really think about it again. And then um, I was finally diagnosed. It was the day I moved to DC. So this was in the summer 20 years ago, I was having um, some issues with my vision. I couldn't quite figure it out. Mm -hmm. It took me a couple of days, actually. It was just like, what is going on? And I realized that when I looked to the left, I was seeing two of everything. And I thought, Mm. that seems like very, (laughs) that's a problem. Correct. (laughs) So um, I didn't have any, I I literally had just moved to DC. So all my doctors were still back in like the Virginia beach area. So, um, I called my mom cause I didn't think, you know, I should be driving cause I, my yeah, eyes weren't working. Good idea. <laughs> and so she came and got me and brought me back home. It's like four hour drive or so from DC to that area. And then, um, had an appointment with an ophthalmologist it was, a, she was a huge bitch, but she was asking me all these questions, you know, about like, is anything else going on? Is your purse heavy? And I was like, is my purse heavy. And I'm wow. like one of those people is my purse is like this big. So it's like, <laughs> it's nope. never, I've never had a heavy purse. And I was like, no. And then she actually thought I had myasthenia gravis, which is mm. another autoimmune disease that affects muscles. Mm-hmm. So she thought, you know, maybe I had that. And then, you know, she's like, well, is anything else weird? And I was like, well, you know, my feet are numb. And she's like, well, how long have your feet been numb? And I'm like, I don't know, like six months. And then she looked at me like I was just like the biggest idiot in the world. And she's like, well, why oh didn't you God. tell me that? And I'm like, cause you're an eye doctor, you know, like, yeah, right. I think I'm telling an eye doctor that my feet were numb, but my feet had gone numb. Like my left foot went numb and then my right foot followed and also went numb. And it was like, you know, my left foot was more numb and it had like weird things. Like it felt cold all the time or whatever. And then I remember, you know, just her reaction to that she was like, well, it's probably MS. And I didn't know what MS was, but I still like burst into tears because I was like, sounds terrible. And I did know one person who had MS, who was somebody who was a teacher at my high school. Mm. And I, you know, never really made any, you know, and it was never that curious about it. It was just Mm. weird to me that sometimes she used a scooter and sometimes she didn't. And sometimes mm-hmm. she used a cane and sometimes she didn't. Like I always, you know, I thought that was weird. Yeah. But I never really like, you know, I didn't know anything about MS. Right. And then, you know, I was in a new city where I moved to without a job. And then I had this oh, God. diagnosis of MS, which I didn't have like really good insurance or anything at the time. So I had to wait like three weeks from that doctor's appointment to an MRI and then another three weeks to an appointment with a neuro ophthalmologist to give me the results of the MRI. So it was, you know, by that time, you know, it was 20 years ago, but they did have Google back then. So I was able to, do you mean Dr. Dr. Google doctor? Yes. The doctor. Yeah. Good Dr. Google. Yeah. I went to that same doctor. (laughs) 
<laughs> it was so obvious that it, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Like once I was like really reading through symptoms, cause I could just ch- check up, like I had Lermet sign too. So I was just like, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. look, electrical signals shooting down my back check. and just, you know, <laughs> yeah. check that off. And right. I was just looking through past things. I was like, Oh, that happened to me before mm-hmm. that's happened to me before. And so I think it was, you know, I probably had it for seven years before mm-hmm. I was actually diagnosed that I just would have weird little sensory things, mm-hmm. or, you know, I'd have to wake up in the middle of the night and pee like five times and that mm-hmm. seemed weird, but nothing that was like the definitive diagnosis right. until, you know, when your that's, eyes don't work. Yes. I think that that's that the one that most of us, that's the one that sent me in too. And yeah, yeah, I can trace mine back. So I've been diagnosed 14 years, but I can trace mine back about 30 years to when my yeah. weird symptoms started. But like you, I just kind of poo-pooed him. And when I think about some of the excuses that I came up for them, they're comical, but I f- completely believed them. So, you know, denial is strong. I always say I'm yeah. Cleopatra, queen of denial, but it's quite frankly, it's worked really well for me in this exactly. whole MS journey. So whatever. So it's funny how, it's not funny, haha, but funny, strange, how similar... So this is, I don't know, my 103rd, maybe fourth um, interview for the FUMS podcast show. And when I talk to folks with MS, it is just striking how similar so many of our paths have been to get a diagnosis. And I just, I'm seeing it uh, improve a bit um, since when we were diagnosed, but not like it needs to be, but here's hoping. So how did you get into Pilates in general? And then how did you decide to dedicate your business to people like us with neurological issues? So I should say the first time I did Pilates was when I was working for um, CBS. I I did like a morning show. So it was sort of like a Today Show, but it was like local to the Hampton Roads area. And we had a fitness segment in that show. We had a cooking, the cooking segment was my favorite segment, clearly. (laughs) And then we had a fitness segment. And so the fitness segment... At one point we had somebody come in that was a Pilates instructor and I didn't, you know, know how to pronounce it or anything. So I remember I, for some reason, I can still remember how it was written. And, you know, this is like 97. So we had, you know, it was very low, low tech. So we had Mm -hmm. literally just this big board and we would write what the segments were. And I remember writing out pilates because I didn't know <laughs> right, how right. to pronounce it. I didn't know it was actually, you know, it is it's someone's name and his name was Joseph Pilates. And so we had this woman come in. So that was my first, you know, introduction to yeah. it. And then I had taken a couple of classes like at the Y and I didn't like it. Mm. Not mm. my thing. Mm-hmm. When I was diagnosed with MS, I was very, very into trail running. That was sort mm. of my fitness thing. And I played a ton of tennis, um, in high school and college, not well, but I played it <laughs> But you played and, it. um, I played it. I, I attempted it and, um, I couldn't like run anymore. I mean, I could, well, I could until I had foot drop, but I couldn't <laughs> like, because I was just having so much like pins and needles sensations, like from the waist down, like whenever I did anything that got my temperature up Mm -hmm. and it was summer when I was diagnosed as well. So, um, I basically asked the doctor, you know, my first neurologist, like what kinds of exercises were good. And she was like, well, swimming. And I was like, don't really have access to a pool. So we're going to have to like knock that off the list. And she said, and then like yoga and Pilates. And I said, well, what's, you know, what's the difference one better than the other? And she's like, no, not really. She she didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so I actually really got into yoga first, but then I got into Pilates to get better at yoga. And then I kept injuring myself because I was flexible, but not really strong. Mm. So I got into Pilates and then I decided I was going to get certified to teach it but just like mat classes, but I was only doing it because I was spending so much money at this yoga studio and the teachers there got free classes. So I was like, Ah, I'll just, you know, get certified and then I'll teach it for free classes. So that's essentially, you know, where it started. Yeah. In in around 2008, I was 
downsized from my job working in like big event production because it was the, I guess that was a recession or something mm-hmm. in 2008. Yep. And so because of that, I had already been teaching Pilates on the side. I just started teaching more Pilates mm. and the balance, sort of the balance of power ended up shifting over. Mm-hmm. And then I did very, very well with the classes that I taught at the studio. And then I actually had investors approach me about opening a st- like an actual Pilates studio with them, which was like perfect timing because I was doing freelance event and video production on the side. I had, I got married in 2009. So I was able to go on my husband's insurance. So this Perfect. was, you know, pre, pre affordable care acts. Like we're basically, we were uninsurable. Mm-hmm. So I went on my husband's insurance, started teaching Pilates full time. And then I didn't in any way set out to work with, you know, people with, you know, any kind of major issues. I was teaching more of an athletic type class and I still do teach, you know, a pretty athletic type class. Um, I have multiple businesses and one of my businesses is an online studio that's for, you know, normal bodied people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I had a teacher, you know, she knew I had MS and she asked me if I had a training for people with MS because she thought that would be an interesting thing for, you know, us to be able to offer Mm -hmm. teachers. And I was like, no, but how hard could it be? So (laughs) I ended up, um, I'll be right back. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I was like, I'll just hold my beer. I'll be right back. (laughs) So, um, a little, I feel like this needs to be said. So I was valedictorian. I graduated summa cum laude from college. I am a hyperachiever. Like there are people who are like overachievers and I'm in the hyperachiever world. So I was like, well, I should have a manual. So I decided I was going to write a book (laughs) as you know, the first kind of launching point. And then when I was doing the research for this book, that's like goes along with my training, that's 314 pages long. Yeah. I just learned so much. And what was really interesting is I learned so much about myself and things that I didn't really recognize and failures of doctors to send me to physical therapy and Mm -hmm. that I was seeing things that weren't going away. And I was like, oh, that's what spastic V is. And oh, Mm -hmm. I definitely have that in like a mild version. And it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, I don't have incontinence. So I don't think I have any bladder issues, but it's like, but it's hard for me to start to pee when I Mm -hmm. need to pee. So it's like, but so I do have, you know, Mm -hmm. neurological bladder issues. So it's just like learning all these different things. And then, you know, just kind of throughout time, I was seeing clients who had, you know, MS and then it sort of expanded. I was getting people with um, spinal cord injury and stroke Mm -hmm. and Parkinson's and just different neurological issues. And then my training right after I developed it, got picked up in Europe and there was a education provider who was designing his own MS based course. When he found out that I had done it, he basically was like, well, why would I do it? If you know, somebody who actually has MS has already done it. So I had a contract with him to come over to the UK to teach teachers and, and Mm. physiotherapists they're physiotherapists, they're not physical therapists, right, right, right. So teachers and physiotherapists, how to work with different common symptoms like balance, mm-hmm. weakness, foot drop, hemiparesis of so single sided weakness, bladder and mm-hmm. bowel problems, um, spasticity, things like that. And so that was actually a sponsored program with the UK MS Society and this organization that teachers who went through the training, it was grant funded by the UK MS Society. And then Mm. they had to then see a certain number of clients and do sort of case studies on them. So I was, had the benefit of the stuff I had come up with being actually used in a a clinical setting That's because the way they do it in Europe is just a little bit different. So they don't so much just have a regular neurologist. They have an MS nurse. This is in the UK. And the Mm -hmm. MS nurse is basically the person who manages their care. And then they go to the neurologist much less often Mm -hmm. than we go to the neurologist. They get MRIs a lot less often than we get MRIs. So 
just how it's done is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And then over time, you know, it, the course just sort of grew. And then I ended up adding Parkinson's and stroke to that course and mm-hmm. then um, had a business partner who is an applied physiologist who is an exceptionally good and brilliant teacher. And then we formed the Neuro Studio together to sort of be a one stop location for continuing education for people who are working with people with neurological conditions, but then also have a patient focused section Mm. of it. Wow. That was a very long answer. So is, is Pilates particularly well suited for neuro challenged folks? I mean, beyond what other types of exercises can offer? Um, One thing to, to know first is that Pilates was originally designed for rehabilitative purposes. Oh, didn't so it was not designed for LeBron James. LeBron <laughs> James does Pilates, but it's not, he's not, he was not the original person that they were going after. Um, originally Joseph Pilates, he was in an internment camp uh, during mm. World War One. He was a German interned in England. And so during that time, he was, he was, he was a very interesting background. He was a boxer and a, like a fitness model and a circus performer and did all these different things, Holy cow! but he was, he was taking things like springs from beds because back in the day, beds had springs in them and he was using them as like resistance, but it was resistance to be helpful to people. So mm. the way we would use spring resistance in Pilates is it can sometimes assist movement or can sometimes resist movement. And so he was using it as more of an assistive thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as his stuff developed, he ended up having more of an athletic kind of twist to it. Now we don't do, you know, we don't expect that people own this equipment. Um, It's very, very expensive, very specialized equipment. And a lot of it is really big. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we base our stuff more on, Pilates principles, which mm-hmm. would be, you know, how we would move somebody's body, how we would think about how the body is a system. And it's not like we're working one part while not working other parts. Mm-hmm. It's about thinking about the things that we lose when we have MS, which are like balance, strength, and mobility. So basically Mm -hmm. exercises are based on balance, strength, and mobility. And then we have to also add into it the understanding of neuroscience. So that's also sort of a, you know, side passion of mine is understanding and really studying neuroscience and understanding how we can create detour circuitry when we have MS lesions blocking Mm -hmm. a, a pathway for information traveling from point A to point B, which is what makes our foot not lift up or makes our leg not want to bend or whatever, you know, different Mm -hmm. thing that we're using. But in terms of going to somebody and working with them privately, which is, you know, what I've trained all these people to do, it is like understanding of like, if somebody is literally in a wheelchair and cannot move their leg at all, it's like how we can use the spring resistance and how we can use the Pilates apparatus and different apparatus to be able to assist with movement. But a lot of it is about giving feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, I always say that people with neurological conditions are sensory starved. We don't have normal sensation. Mm -hmm. We don't Mm -hmm. get normal feedback from our reflexes and our environment. So our bodies don't behave as they should because they're not getting the right information. Or just our bodies don't behave. (laughs) Or they just, Period. Don't but they're, <laughs> right. but they're like, you know, I feel like a lot of times there's a lot of, there's this idea that we have. And I mean, we all have like, this is my bad side. This is my whatever side. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, first of all, the bad side is a lot of times not the side that working on is going to the fix the problem it. is yes. work on the other side because the other side is compensating for the bad side. So, so crazy. a lot of times it's the, the good side is often the problem. Yeah. But you know, our brain is doing the best it can do. You know, our bodies are trying to figure it out in this weird, like we're not getting the right signals. We're not getting the right information. So Mm -hmm. your body is making choices. And all of those choices are about protecting 
the person, Mm -hmm. right? Spasticity is a protective reflex because Mm -hmm. it's like this joint doesn't feel safe. We're going to tighten up around the joint. Lock it down. <laughs> lock it, lock that shit down. Like, don't let it move at all. Because if it doesn't right. move at all, chances are you won't get hurt. Won't get you hurt. Know? Yeah. So we're, you know, it's like, I mean, I hate my body a lot of the times. I'm just like, oh, really? Like, why are you doing that right now? Like, it's really bad timing or it's really aggravating or, you know, you've had, mm-hmm. had it for so long that I do have some stuff that's never gotten better. But I think we need to look at it as like our bodies are doing the best that they can. And the way we really approach exercise is like, what is your body doing and why is it doing that? Mm -hmm. And then when we understand that and we can give our body other choices, like, will it make those other choices? Because I think a lot of the times when people think about exercise, they're like, okay, you have foot drop. We need to strengthen your dorsiflexors. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how's that working out for you? Mm -hmm. Never has worked out for me. Because if you say like, okay, we're not getting a good signal to your dorsiflexors, like, well, I find e step can be really helpful, but it's like, well, not everybody has that. I find vibration plates can be helpful. Not everybody has those. Really what we need to do is figure out like, okay, well, if we can't get the dorsiflexors stronger, what are all the other ways that your body can move? And why has your body chosen you know, a lot of times it's locking down your calf. So a lot of mm-hmm. times it's calf spasticity that's limiting your ability to dorsiflex or lift your foot mm-hmm. towards your shin, which is what makes you trip and what foot drop is. You know, I think there there's a lot of, I think, well-meaning fitness people out there who are not seeing the person as a whole system and understanding the body as a whole system. Mm. You know, we're like, can your right arm affect your left leg? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Mm -hmm. we're like, we know your right arm can affect the movement of your left leg because it's like how it's something called your central pattern generators and how your body moves. And that's a spinal reflex in terms of like opposite arm leg. So if your leg's not working, well, let's not sit there and work on your leg for an hour. That is not getting us anywhere. Let's try other strategies Mm -hmm. that we can give somebody because ultimately what we want is somebody's body to stop making the bad Poor decisions choice. You know, <laughs> yes. it's like, like I always say, like when I don't have kids, but when people have kids, like I like it when people say to their kids, make good choices. Yes. Instead of my mom always said like, don't hurt yourself. Yeah. You know, right. she was always very alarmist. And I feel like, you know, my sister and I, we were good kids. She could have just said, make good choices, mm-hmm. you know? Right. That's what we would have done, you know, yeah. other than don't freak us out. Just tell right. us. <laughs> do, do your best. Yeah. Just do your best. Do your level best. Yeah. I mentioned at the top of this that I have recently started Pilates. And I was telling you before I started recording that I'm really liking it. And everyone who's listened to this podcast for any amount of time knows. I fucking hate exercise, but the the key to that is I still do it because I want to keep moving and I want to feel better. And I do feel better after I exercise. It is the actual act of exercising that I hate. And I hate taking time out to do something like that. However, comma, let me just tell you about this Pilates stuff, everyone, because I'm a little bit blown away by it. First of all, it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. To me, it is so empowering rather than just like, let's do 50 leg lifts or whatever, you know, other things I've tried. Well, first of all, I have, I have an excellent teacher who really takes the time to explain things to me. And we're going to do this because, which I think is so helpful and it's empowering. And so we're going to do this because, and these are the muscles that are going to be affected. And this is how you do this. And we're going to do it slowly. And you're thinking the entire time. I keep saying, for me, Pilates is more difficult on my brain than it is on my body because I have to think and I go slowly and I'm thinking, breathe this way, push that way. And, and this is the muscle group that I'm using and just thinking about it affects my body so differently. If I'm doing it absentmindedly, I might be just moving. But when I 
think about it and I'm reminded to think about it and we're working on these, this muscle or whatever it is. And I zone in on that and I'm using my, my head is connecting to my body. It is a wholly different situation and I literally feel those muscles and I'm moving them. And I have to tell you, it is so empowering to know that you can have that effect on your own body. I mean, I think anyone who gets a big diagnosis like MS to some degree, hopefully just at the beginning, but some people throughout the entire course feels disempowered, feels like their body has betrayed them, feels like what the hell could I do? Like now I have this thing. Whereas from my perspective with Pilates, it's very empowering. I'm taking this back from the bastard and I'm going, okay, this is where I need to work. Okay. I'm concentrating on that right now. And I'm doing very specific exercises for that. And I literally feel it in my head and in my body and I'm doing it. So I find it so incredibly empowering and yeah, the balance, the flexibility, the strength, all of it, I, I feel, whereas a lot of other things that I've done, I don't. I mean, I know that I'm probably getting stronger and all those things, but I don't feel it. And with this, I feel it. Well, one thing you said that I think is super important for people to understand, you know, there's always all this talk about neuroplasticity and like exercise mm-hmm. equals neuroplasticity and do lots of reps and whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but if your brain doesn't give a shit right. about what you're doing, it doesn't change. It's like the only time you're actually going to have neuroplastic changes in your brain is when your brain is interested in what's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's interested in stuff because it's novel. It's interested in stuff that's fun. It's interested in stuff that's rewarding. But like we train people that if you are a teacher and you're training somebody and their eyes are darting all over the place, they are not in that movement. Yeah. They are engaged. like, you know, they're not engaged in it. And mm-hmm. so if somebody's not engaged in a movement, like it's your job as a teacher to immediately get them back. And it might be that that is not the right movement for them because mm-hmm. their body might not be able to figure it out. And that eye darting thing is like, it's almost like a brain scan where you're just like, <laughs> either you're bored or you're doing this brain scan thing where you're just like, (laughs) what am I supposed to be feeling? I'm not feeling it where I'm supposed to be feeling it. So maybe like, maybe this is wrong in this way or that way or whatever. (laughs) And so what we're trying to do is get people to like be in their bodies when they're moving Mm -hmm. and to always understand why we're asking them to do something Mm -hmm. because some of it doesn't necessarily makes sense for what you're thinking, right? You're just so like, well, true. I have foot drop. So why are we doing all these hip exercises? Yes. And I'm like, well, if your hip is unstable, then your foot does not have like your, when you stand on one leg and your other leg swings through your leg moves in a little bit. And I'm like, if you don't have that happening, you need to actually have more dorsiflexion or more ability to lift your foot to take that step through Mm -hmm. without tripping. So if we can get, you know, go up the chain and have this happen, then that could change it. If you're like way hunched forward, it's like the amount of pressure that you're putting on your ankle when you have calf spasticity is greater than Mm -hmm. if we were standing upright. So, you know, I think like my mission, if I have a mission, is sort of twofold. It's like to reach patients, but it's also to really reach the people who are working with the patients to understand and speaking from somebody who feels it in my own body, Mm -hmm. you know, and can say like, oh, well, it feels like this to say like, oh, if we were like, if we made this change, it would affect it in this way. Mm -hmm. And I think like the thing with MS being so, you know, individual it's not every exercise is the right exercise for somebody. So we right. teach every exercise in multiple different variations, right? So it's like Pilates has a lot of stuff that, you know, we always say there's just shapes, right? And it's like this shape is repeated on the mat, on the reformer, on the chair, on the Cadillac, on whatever, but it's basically like, we're just making shapes. Mm. And so when you, take somebody through those things and they're doing stuff that's familiar, Mm -hmm. it's easier to learn it, but it's not boring because you're not doing, you know, 
we're going to do like, yeah, 25. Yeah. yeah. Leg lifts. <laughs> right. Right. Same old, same old. Like, right. Well, and it really promotes body awareness. I mean, I, I thought I had body awareness, but I apparently did not because this is really introducing me to pieces, parts I didn't A, know that I had and B, did not know that they had muscles. <laughs> so, But I think that it's natural for people whose bodies fail them to have selective amnesia yeah. about their body. I mean, there's actually like, you know, names for it. One, I'm having like a cognitive moment where I'm forgetting it. It'll <laughs> Cog- oh, have me inattention. So if you have like um, weakness on one side mm-hmm. of your body, you just choose not to acknowledge that side of your body. You're right. Like, my left right. leg is dead to me. Like I yeah. don't straighten my leg in certain exercises, even though I could straighten my leg, but I just, I don't do it mm-hmm. unless somebody tells me to do it because it's just like, I just don't yeah. pay Ignore attention to it. Right. It doesn't treat you right. Therefore, you're not going to treat it right. (laughs) Right. I get that. I I mean, I think it's also just like, I mean, it's mentally a protective thing, right? You're just like, I'm going to dissociate. Right. Right. Yeah. To whatever degree I need to dissociate to be able to, you know, get through my day and with, you know, the amount of energy and happiness that I need to be able to get through my day. Right. Compartmentalizing what it is that you're dealing with or choosing not to deal with can be certainly mentally protective. So yeah, I get that. The doors to the Patients Getting Paid membership community are now wide open. This is a community of people with chronic illness learning to find and create flexible remote work that accommodates their health. I call us chronic panors. There are trainings, coaching calls, networking opportunities, co-workings, and a ton of resources. Want to take better care of yourself and still generate an income? Join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Your methods are in clinical trials at two universities, right? What what schools? So it's and well, what does that exactly one mean? One and a, it's sort of one and a half. So okay, at the University of Colorado, they're using. Um, it's really Megan. This is my business partner's stuff that mm. she that she's handling the clinical trials. So I give her credit for that. But um, so at the University of Colorado, they're looking at what we call our four quadrant stability model. Um, basically think about it this way. If you are not stable standing on your right foot, you can't mm-hmm. lift your left foot up. Mm-hmm, right. I think that everyone understands that. Yeah. But it's stability is kind of bigger than that. It's, but in, essentially to be able to have proper movement, you need to have stability in the four quadrants, which are your hips and your shoulders. Mm. So just think of us as quadrupedal animals. If we were on in quadruped, our hips and our shoulders, basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why we really look at like, if somebody is, you know, their shoulder, basically like your rotator cuff Mm -hmm. holds your arm in, it basically keeps your arm from falling off your body. (laughs) Very important in that way. Your your hip muscles, your glutes and your outer hips and everything that keeps your legs from falling off your body. (laughs) So we really look at those four quadrants and having people be stable in those four quadrants when they're moving to improve balance, to improve spasticity, to improve gait. So what they're testing is the use of the NeuroStudio four quadrant stability model in balance and gait, and also looking at seated Pilates exercises because some people can't do can't get down on the floor to do the mat work. So we're doing mm-hmm. both seated and non-seated. And then University of Illinois was also going to be doing a study, but they're sort of in a financial stall right now. So mm-hmm. the one that's currently underway is at University of Colorado. Got but it. I think that's like very gratifying to what we do that, you know, we always say our stuff is scientifically backed. Like mm-hmm. my books tend to have very, very long bibliographies because I researched the living hell out of stuff. And then it's studio tested. So it's tested by myself and Megan with our clients, but it's also tested by the 1400 people 
that have been trained in our methods who are mm-hmm. out there telling you about pe- that I exist because right. they know about me from the work that I've done more on um, the practitioner side than on the patient side. Yeah. I love that you just said, I think it was Illinois you mentioned was in a, in, in a financial stall. I'm going to use that. I'm in a financial I, stall right now. <laughs> I, our, who is not in a financial stall a little bit? But that's what I'm going to say to my kids when they want some money. I'm going to say I'm in a financial stall right now. I'm sorry. You're going to have to go find somebody else. How does having MS yourself help you to understand what others with this disease may need? I mean, I think it's like, it is very different to have somebody who doesn't have MS tell you what you should be doing or what you could be doing. I don't believe in telling people they should be doing anything. I'm be like, do whatever you want. This, yeah. this is my advice, but do what you I want. I always say, don't um, show it all over yourself. <laughs> right. It's like, it's very annoying, but it's like, if people don't understand what it's like to have a muscle go into spasm, if they don't understand what it's like to get hot and feel like there's literally kryptonite like Mm -hmm. on you at that moment, or who don't understand what it's like for your leg when you're walking all of a sudden to stop working. Like, it's not that I don't listen to them, but it's more that I'm just like, you don't get it. You know, it's like, okay, but you don't get it. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I hope you never get it, you know, random people out there. I'm like, I hope you never know, but you don't know. And so when you're telling somebody that has MS, you know, that's got really bad fatigue or whatever, and you don't understand what that's like, I just think that, you know, it definitely lends me a certain credibility with people I've worked with, because I can also show them on my body, what is happening. You know, Mm -hmm. like I have like my left leg hyperextends. That's Mm. very common when you have spasticity. It's common when you have foot drop. It's common when you have weakness. I have a client who mainly uses a wheelchair. She can use a walker for short distances. Her leg is my leg, but like many, many, many times worse. Mm -hmm. But I can Mm -hmm. show her, I'm like, see how my leg is doing that. It's like, the reason it's doing that is because of this. Mm -hmm. But I understand how hard it is for her to try not to do that. It's like, I can't make that not happen, you know, because mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of times um, like a, a PT or somebody will say like, oh, just do this. And it's like, okay, well, so I want you to <laughs> just wiggle your ears. And if that <laughs> right. person doesn't have the ability to wiggle their ears, that's about the same as you asking me to lift my foot up more than it lifts up. Because right. it's like, well, you don't have the there. nerve connection to wiggle your ears, nor do I, but I also don't have the nerve connection to do this one thing. So what you're asking I, me to do. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. And then I also just have a personal aggravation. I would say there's a lot of like MS experts and whatever out there who use we a lot in how they talk. And I'm just like, there's no we. Right. You are not us. It's like, and I, I appreciate the work that they're doing and that they're trying to help people. But it's like when people are talking about like, I don't like these canes or whatever. And I'm like, have you ever needed to use a cane? Like yeah, it right. just, it's like, it's, it's icky to me when mm-hmm. people use it and like, yeah, it's disingenuous. I agree. Right. Yeah. I'm just like, you don't like, if you know. have something else that I don't have, you can talk about it as an I, but if, yeah. you, have, if you don't have the thing that I have, you can't talk about it as a we. Yeah, like, I agree. I agree. And I think your words have power. And I think it's, I think it's really important to be specific in your verbiage yeah. across the way. So I totally agree. I get where you're coming from on that one. You are quite the entrepreneur. I mean, you mentioned that you've got a number of businesses, but I would call you a chronic panor. I like that. I'm going to steal that. I love that. (laughs) It's also very true because I've had many businesses in the past as well. Perfect. And you've invented the Fuse Ladder. Can you tell us what that is and when someone would use it? How would you describe this? The Fuse Ladder is um, basically it's a, so what stall bars are, you know, a very old school gym thing. And a stall bar is like a ladder that has like a pull-up bar on it. Mm-hmm. That's the simplest way I could say it. And you you could see old gym 
stuff from like the thirties and forties where people had like rows and rows and rows of stall bars. So, um, when I had my second studio, my third Pilates studio, this is my second, no, cause my second and third Pilates studio both had fuse ladders. Um, I wanted to have something that was different than other gyms. And so what I decided to do was I was like, I'm going to make you know a piece of equipment. And because I had this Pilates background, but because I also had done a lot of yoga, I used to teach bar, I've, you know, done different things. I was like, I want to do something that is a standing thing. And also because one thing where there's a, a very big shortfall in Pilates, like classical Pilates is it's mostly lying down mm. or seated. And if you like me have balance issues, and if you like me, you're seeing yourself lose ability in terms of walking and climbing stairs and things like that, you need to be doing more standing exercises. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create something that was mostly a standing exercise thing. So the fuse ladder has attachments for springs that are the same springs that you would use in Pilates things. Mm -hmm. Um, It also has other places for other types of attachments like like suspension things like a TRX can be attached to it. Mm. And it doesn't really take up a lot of space. So we used it at our studio. We had um, 12 at our studio. So we would use it for group classes that were for more like athletic people. And Mm -hmm. it's sold currently. um, We have distributors in the US, in Europe, in um, the Middle East, in Asia, and in Australia. So it's sold kind of all over the place and it's sold to both the PT world and like the athletic training world. So there's a couple of like pro athletes who've used it. And if you ask me who they are, I actually could not tell you because I know (laughs) nothing about sports, but I know some of the people who bought them are training people who are professional rugby players or professional baseball players. And I'm just like, I, I I couldn't tell you. (laughs) If it's not like somebody like super, super famous, I have no idea. Yeah. But um, it was something that, you know, it's sort of what's filling a need that I had. And then, you know, I just, my business partner, I have multiple businesses. So my business partner in this business was my studio business partner. She and I were like, you know, let's see if we can get these like mass produced. And I knew Pilates, a Pilates manufacturing company. I know actually several, but one of them that I approached was willing to have it made for us. And so they had it, you know, did the actual design from our original version, which was like a handmade ladder Mm -hmm. with, you know, prototype little, Mm -hmm. yeah, the prototype. And then they made the actual ones that we sell that we've, we're coming up on our newest iteration, which will be one that's height adjustable. Okay. And has something called the push-through bar. So the push-through bar is something that's on the Pilates Cadillac. And you can do a lot of cool things with it. We're adding it to the next version of the fuse ladder as an option. But the fuse ladder is um, about seven and a half feet tall. And that's too tall for some people's Mm -hmm. houses. So we're having that you can remove nine inches of the base of it so that basically you can remove the lowest rung and then the outer parts, but it actually attaches to the wall. Okay. And what um, do you do it on attaches. it? I mean, do you actually go up it like I mean, a ladder? You can, like we do so many things. So you can do all of the Pilates tower exercises, which that's like its own repertoire. You can use the rungs for like climbing and hanging the way the pull-up bars work. They hang in different directions we do suspension exercises, almost like TRX, but we use springs, which is mm. way more challenging than a TRX because the TRX is, it doesn't move, but right. springs move. It has its own workout website. So there's different teachers who teach on that. Some people do like a cardio-based class. I can't really do a lot of jumping or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's not for me. Right. Mine are more Pilates and strength training based. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other people who do like yoga on it. Wow. So I don't know, hundreds hundreds of exercises, the Fantastic. training for teachers, um, the training manual has about 200 exercises in it. Jeez. And that's not even all of what you can do with it. Wow. Well, congratulations on that and on everything. This has been fascinating, Risk. I so appreciate you being here and for sharing all this with us today. If people want to learn more about you or your program, where do they go? My website hasn't been updated in a while, but you could go to just 
mariskabreland.com. That's sort of the breadth of all the different things that I do. Okay. Um, and then the neurostudio.com talks about, you know, we have a subscription service that's workouts for people with neurological conditions that's divided based on like seated exercises, standing exercises, and then symptoms. Like if you want to work on balance issues, if you want to work on foot drop, if you want to work on whatever, but you'll notice that our foot drop stuff sometimes is going to like have upper body exercises in it because we do have sort of a different way of now um, we know why. working with things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we've talked because through that system. Yeah, that's right. And, it's all attached. <laughs> yeah, and, and our workshops. So I do, and I have workshops that are, you know, patient focused workshops. I have one that I spent over a year working on and it's basically every single thing I thought anyone with MS could want to know about having MS. Wow. Um, it's 27 hours of content, Good but it's gracious. all, it's all d- designed in little chapters. So it's like little three Good. minute to 10 minute chunks. Good, so you good. can basically look up specific things and it's also, you know, has, you know, chunks of there's like, just want to know about movement. If you just want to know about the business side of MS, like, you know, employment law and disability law and things like that, there's sections on all of those things. Fantastic. And so just to, just to be super clear, because she is um, located in DC, but this is, th- this is all available online. So yes, anyone from anywhere, it is available to you. And we, as always, will be putting all of these links in the show notes. So if you're out there walking or doing anything, don't worry about it. We'll have it in the show notes. Just uh, go to our podcast page and find it. Well, I just can't thank you enough. This is super interesting. I look forward to uh, following you in the future. I'm coming up to DC in the near future, and I'm hoping that I can get by your studio and have a, yeah, have a look. That would be so interesting. So we here in the FUMS nation speak to the stupid disease as it deserves, and we tell it FUMS every day. Mariska, would you please lead us in our salute to MS with middle fingers extended, of course, on three. Are you ready? I am absolutely ready. Two, three. F U M S. Yay! <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank Appreciate you. you. Quick shout out to Steve Woodward at podcastingeditor.com for the fantastic work on this podcast, including editing, show notes, and ingenious ideas. If you'd like help with your podcast, whether you're just starting out or an old pro, visit podcastingeditor.com and tell Steve I sent you. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you listening to the FUMS Podcast Show. Be sure to subscribe to it so you won't miss an episode. You can do that right on the website at FUMSnow.com. While you're there, sign up for the free email list so you'll be among the first to know of any new findings in MS research, new therapies and products, as well as any blog posts and podcast episodes I release. Want to chat with others in the FUMS community? Join us on Facebook at FUMS Now. Thanks again, and don't forget to talk to the stupid disease as it deserves. Tell it FUMS every day.